Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Mitch Michaels from the Santa Monica Studios. The summer hardcourt season is upon us, and we're going outside the tennis bubble just a little bit today with a special guest. We share the same office building, so it wasn't a complete stranger situation, but he's been with Bally Sports, formerly Fox Sports, for, I think, 23 years? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, Fox Sports West, I joined... Mitch in 2004. Okay. But prior to that, I started in Fox Sports Radio yeah. in 2000. Family, okay. Yeah, exactly. Started in the radio, overnight radio, and then in about 2002, 03, kind of started the, the TV climb. Well, Patrick O'Neill's here. It's a pleasure to chat with you. Uh, Angel's voice for the studio shows and some play-by-play. L.A. King Studio, uh, a mainstay there. And uh, I guess it's just a lot to discuss. I know you're a tennis fan, too. We're going to dive into all that. But I am, yeah. first thing is timing being everything. And before we get to the deeper issues and the deeper stuff, you kind of timed, especially the King stuff, pretty good. And even the Angels with some <laughs> generational talent. But Yeah, I did. Yeah. Didn't I? <laughs> yeah. I definitely lucked into this whole entire career. And yeah. the, the teams and the players I've had to cover has been a dream, no doubt. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a fascinating thing to think about because you're in an industry which, you know, I would say I'm on the outskirts of, but we're in the same industry where it's super competitive and it's super, you know, difficult to find your footing, make a name, and then have the successes that you've had. But what I liked about your story, first of all, was it wasn't the traditional path. There's nothing wrong with going to the best schools, going to the broadcast schools, and then getting your apprenticeship right out, but that wasn't your path at all. No, no, it definitely wasn't. I, I jumped into, I dropped out of college after two years. I went to Laverne and I wanted to be an actor, come from a family mm-hmm. of actors, mom, mm-hmm. dad, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, everybody. So I thought that was kind of the, the path for me. I sort of thought that that was um, maybe an, an easy way out. I, I thought it, I actually thought it was going to be uh, easy to get work and nothing was further from the truth. I was green. I, I didn't have any experience. Um, I started taking acting classes and whatnot. I definitely studied a lot. Didn't Couldn't land the, the jobs, though. I, I struggled quite a bit. I had to look up Laverne. I'm not from out here, so I had to oh. look up the school oh, and yeah. kind of the area. But no, I mean, you. so you were a, a SoCal native or did you guys move around a little bit? No, SoCal native, okay. born and raised, born at St. John's Hospital, just okay. about you know two miles or less from where yeah. we are right now. And um, my parents split up when I was really young, so mm-hmm. bounced around with my mom, but a, and then live with my dad on the weekends and, and whatnot. Um, family from Michigan, so I'd mm. spend some winters and some little bit of some yeah. early summers there. But mainly the the L.A. SoCal area for sure. Okay, so you got that Midwest winter toughness that some people I did. don't. Yeah, I lived in New York for four years. Oh too. yeah, true. So. Yeah. So so when when this career path started, so you go to college. You come from the family of actors. Mm-hmm. We know your father Ryan O'Neill and a, a legacy. Like he's on the Hollywood Walk of Fame now. Thank so you, yeah. you go from dropping out of college to moving to New York. And that was, you're going to chase the acting mm-hmm. bartending to get by type kinda, life. Yeah, yeah. Kind of Mitch. It's like, well, I had a, a good couple of years here in LA mm-hmm. uh, with some great chances mm-hmm. uh, as an actor. I mean, like some, some really cool series auditions, callbacks, getting to the, getting mm-hmm. really close to yeah. getting some, some good parts and just couldn't cross the finish line on yeah. those and had some, you know, when you're in your early 20s and, I don't know, sometimes there's some family issues, struggles, and, yeah, yeah. and I just felt I had to get out on my own, kind of mm-hmm. away from my family and just mm-hmm. kind of discover, you know, what type of person am I? Can I actually survive and pay my own bills? That yeah. was, I felt that was important to me. I felt I was a little bit um, handicapped with, oh, well, if I didn't get this job, let me just ask dad for some right. money or, you know, get did, get a cheap rent here. Did you feel like that sometimes you were able to kind of get the auditions, but then it almost would hurt you once you got in the door? Like your name and stuff might have gotten mm. you a chance? Well, it definitely got me a chance. Yeah. got me an agent, and I'm sure yeah. it got me some auditions. There was also some, you know, I had a, a brother that had some pro- uh, problems with the law, and I don't think they knew um, that, there was another O'Neill, like a young, you know, okay, and yeah. so I would get mistaken a little bit for my older brother, and that hurt me for sure a little bit. And but then, it, it ultimately, in anything that you do, yeah. talent's going to win out. Mm-hmm. And if I was good enough, right, to to land those parts, they would have hired me. And they're like, this guy's got confidence; he's good enough for this part. He's exactly what we're looking for. Let's go for it. But they saw through yeah. a little of that. I did not have the confidence <laughs> to get those jobs, and uh, that's all. They would have hired yeah. me if I was good enough. How, how old were you when you made that decision? Like, okay, I, I don't want to be in the acting business anymore. And was it the same time frame or a little later when you're like, sports is the passion? Oh, I always had a passion for sports, and I 
loved I, when I was watch games. I would always focus a lot on the broadcasters. Uh. I thought if I could make it as an actor, mm. maybe I could be a broadcaster. I swear it sounds stupid, but mm. I loved Sports Center and ESPN when it first broke. You know, in eighty three, eighty four, eighty five, all those. I, I mm-hmm. kind of worshipped those um, those guys that anchored Sports Center. Um, but no, I, I moved to New York for about four years. Did a lot of bartending there. Came back to LA. Got back into acting. But it was when I didn't get this job on a show uh, called Band of Brothers. I got mm-hmm. to the final callback, didn't get it. And that's when I, I had this epiphany. I thought, it's over. Because I, I kind of had some help getting the audition. I knew Tom Hanks who wanted me for this part, and I still couldn't get it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, man, that's it. That's got to be it. And I decided then and there that I wanted to uh, take a career change. And I was going to get in a, in a, be a production. Yeah. I wanted to maybe be a producer, director in sports. And I was going to get a job as a PA, but then they gave me a chance to be a, a broadcaster. And that's Is that radio for the first gig? Well, first, they, they I got a couple auditions on mm-hmm. TV. Okay. And I didn't get those, but somebody, a guy named George Greenberg, wonderful yeah. man, saw my tape and really liked me, gave me a couple more chances, didn't get those. But I he had mentioned Fox Sports Radio was just launching in 2000, fall of 2000, and said, uh, all right, call the program director, Tom Lee, over there. I did, got an audition did well on the audition and got offered the overnight update. Anchor. That's yeah. I had that in my notes. So you were willing at that point. It's, it's a tough thing to do to be like, okay, time to go to the next career, make a career change mm-hmm. as an adult, but also willing to put the work in, which is a pretty valuable lesson to people of all ages. Like your foot in the door was the overnight shift. That's it. Yep. 30 bucks an hour, 12 to 5 AM <laughs> yeah. Monday to Friday. Um, <laughs> and it was three updates an hour at 20, 40 and top of the hour. It was, a minute, a break, a minute at 20, a minute, a break, a minute at 40, and then two minutes, break, minute yeah. at the top. And we, Yeah. We have some jokes here. I just sort of cut you off, but it's always right. like, because we worked in production with tennis and stuff, that that altered our sleep schedule almost permanently. Totally. 100%. Yeah. 100%. I still don't yeah. sleep well. Absolutely. Um, I, yeah. Luckily, I don't take the same sleep meds to get me to sleep as I did then when yeah. I'd get home at 6 AM. And then I went to six days a week and I, I, I really struggled Mm -hmm. the first couple of weeks. I was very green there. Nobody, you know, you had to figure it out on your own. No one's going to, you know, tell you how to do it, Mm -hmm. but I learned how to do it. And I, then I got confidence and I got better. And then I got, um, after a full year, um, actually nine 11 happened really kind of the next year and and we turned into full news. And and so, man, I, I really got my, my feet wet in broadcasting by learning how to do it. And I would do six days a week, you know, Monday through Saturday overnight Mm -hmm. for almost two years. Were you constantly looking for other opportunities? Because I know the the timeline is, I think 2002 was the first real TV job. That's right. Was that on on the goal list? Were you like, I'm trying to work in TV or did that just fortuitously happen? It it, it fortuitously happened. But luckily I'd had those auditions prior to getting the radio gig. The same people at Fox Sports um, were the, the people that I got, was able to get back and get another audition in like February or April mm-hmm. 2002. And then I double dipped a little bit. I would do these uh, TV update um, spots for the best dance sports show period on yeah. Fox Sports. Oh, yeah. They were national. They were like maybe two an hour. And then I would do the overnight. Yeah. My shift got better. I got 11 a.m. Excuse me, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. And I would bank some updates. And I would do that six days a week. And I was okay. a co-host of a radio show. So I'm starting after about... 16 months was getting more reps and then I got the I wanted to get into TV <laughs> yeah, you know you don't bug. forget I come from this family mm-hmm. and I tried to be an actor and so yes that was the ultimate goal but I really wanted to learn how to to be a broadcaster right. and I got to learn doing national radio what was the schedule like when you were double dipping was it insane hours mm-hmm. sleep all over the place mm-hmm. yeah it, it really was yeah it was you know I really wanted to be prepared so um, especially when I first started, if my, my shift started at midnight, mm-hmm. but I would start preparing on these games at like 7 p.m. Mm. I would I was I, w- I would try to write as much as I could, come up with ideas, and then so I mean I was working so much because I knew I had my foot in the door, and I was switching careers, and I said this is what I want to do with my life. So I try I did I worked my yeah. butt off to to accomplish that. When I was double dipping, luckily it didn't happen that long. It was like maybe a month or two. Um, yeah, you're burning the candle, but it didn't matter. (laughs) I was happy to get my foot in that door on TV. Yeah. You said something interesting that brought back a memory for me. And I haven't told this on the show. When I was in college, I went to St. Louis university and even before tennis was a radar and I was just dipping in student radio, Billie Jean King came to the school and I got like five minutes to like talk to her. And then afterwards, she's like the nicest person. Right. She's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, oh, I'm thinking sports, something. I'm not really sure. And she just said, we're not a right and you'll be okay. What, learn how to write. Learn how to write. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. that was like the Good one advice. thing that stuck with me. And then you saying that, it's like, yeah, if you know how to prepare and write stuff out, 
regardless of what avenue you take, it's just yep. going to be beneficial. Yes, yes. What yeah. uh, what was the family's reaction to this career path? And as you were, you know, starting out low on the totem pole and, and kind of working your way up, what was, you know, the reaction to kind of going a little zagging a little in this Hollywood yeah, family? Yeah, you know, it well, it was it was like 12 years of trying to be an actor, Mitch, right? Mm-hmm. That was yeah. not successful. <laughs> so I think I'm already in my early 30s at this point, two children. Yeah. And or one on the one, uh, Sophia was was pretty young, uh, two or th- three years old in there, and then you know Veronica was on the way, my younger daughter, and and uh, I, I remember my dad being you know pretty <laughs> proud and and yeah. listening. Um, so, but I just locked down, man. I, I mm-hmm. wasn't even, I can't even really remember. It was just my, I just had a singular focus to accomplish. Yeah, uh, what I was trying to do. Yeah, I've I've seen too that you know families that are supportive it's the biggest thing. But you know we also know sports aren't for everyone, and you know mm-hmm. some people aren't going to be locked in to a game. I mean everyone's yeah. been to a Super Bowl party, so you can right. kind of tell who the you know real fans <laughs> are there. But no, I think it's cool that she had that support system. The other thing I wanted to ask you before I forget, and I've heard this, you're you were like ground for one of the original OG fantasy football guys, like you yeah. were kind of. Yeah, uh, and and to see where the industry's gone. I, know. I mean, especially I it's just we had the very control. first uh, TV show for fantasy football, yeah. the Ultimate Fantasy Football Show on Fox Sports Net with Andrew Siciliano and <laughs> Warren Moon and Eric Kramer. Did that for maybe two or three years, yeah. I think. And yeah, that was the first one. Um, and yeah, it certainly has come a long way. Was that where you got your love of fantasy football, or were you oh, playing? Yeah. Okay, no, so, I, was, yeah. I was pretty new yeah. at it just yeah. just before. I think if you watch some of those shows, you could probably even think uh, re- <laughs> yeah. uh, realize that yeah. I was. Yeah, I was pretty bad early. I still can't win. You know, <laughs> no, it's <laughs> it's impossible. Uh, more with Patrick O'Neill here on Tennis Channel Inside. And uh, before we get to some other topics, uh, I do want to bring up the King stuff. Okay, because that's probably for me, honestly. Where I first, you know, found you, and, and not just because I wasn't living in L.A., but it was the Kings runs, and we mentioned the timing of everything. You grew up a SoCal native mm-hmm. and a SoCal sports fan, so it had to be a dream come true to work with oh Bob Miller, right? I mean, because that's oh, the guy I was oh, going to talk to. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah. um, absolutely. You know, growing up, my dad and I, we'd watch uh, the Kings games with, with Bob Miller and, and then Jim Fox and... Um, but, yeah, I love the Triple Crown line and Rogie Vashon in the 70s. They weren't on TV a, a bunch in those days. Um, but to me, I just loved hockey and I loved the Kings yeah. so much. And when, when Wayne Gretzky joined the Kings, I was just uh, <laughs> out of control. I knew Wayne a little bit and through my sister <laughs> and my brother-in-law. And so I got to go to those games. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, so it, all I, those stories. So, like, the buzz was real. Like, we can talk about it now. I wasn't here. A lot of younger people don't understand. But when he got traded, the forum yeah. was, like, the place to be for Kings hockey games. It, it was <laughs> as big as Lakers showtime at that time. And that wow. was right when the Lakers yeah. were, you know, 87. Yeah. 88 and you know they were they were huge so when Wayne got to LA it was epic it was insane well the first clip I probably saw you in and this is like a, it's a total compliment I'll just work through it but uh-huh. having to think on your feet and be prepared was the 2012 Kings Cup party Jonathan Quick was a little too uh, right. celebratory and I thought I remember him, you know, kind of letting some words fly there. But yeah, you yeah. had to kind of command the broadcast and take uh, control of it. I, it's kind of embarrassing, right, Mitch? Because <laughs> I was told I had to apologize. And I think I, my big regret is that I said my name. I, I should have just because they, they had to pop me on camera. Yeah. My uh, job was to apologize for the language. I think legally yeah. kind of <laughs> yeah. had to. And, and then I should have just thrown it back there cleverly. Instead, I, thought, I, I kind of panicked. I thought the tone was perfect, though. It was like, like we, hi, have to, we have to I'm apologize. Patrick yeah. O'Neill. I don't, why did I say my name, yeah. though? I'm like, oh, it's just cringeworthy. Well, what um, was it like to be a part? I know as a broadcaster, but still, like, you're on that ride for mm-hmm. a cup run. And in, for a franchise that's never had one, that's the other big point to yeah. make. Well, um, it's interesting. Like, 14, to me, I felt way more part of that team than in 12. We didn't travel for road games until 13, if oh, I'm wow. not mistaken. Uh, we traveled in uh, for road playoff games in, in during the 12 run. But prior to that, we I'm not sure if we did the studio pre-post for road. I can't, I'm, God, I'm just blanking right now. But um, it, it, well, it was awesome, mm-hmm. let's just say. Because yeah. I joined, I, my first year with the t- uh, Kings was 05, mm-hmm. right out of the lockout. And so I was there when, when Andre got, you know, drafted. Yeah. And, and so I saw these guys yeah. and then Drew and, and seeing the team he put together with the trades and yeah. Jer- and and get to be friends with those guys yeah. in a way, you know, even though I'm a lot older, <laughs> they were really nice. Very nice. Yeah. Team. 14 was the one where it was like all those seven game series until mm-hmm. the final. And it yeah. was interesting. A couple of years ago when COVID first started, 
I rewatched that game seven uh, Blackhawks, and I'm like, yeah. I still that, that holds up as one of the best games I've ever seen, like totally. watched on well, that television. Series was that series, that seventh game, yeah. overtime, everything. I was like, it's hard to beat yeah. the skill there. And you had the feeling that whoever wins is winning the Stanley Cup. Yeah, well, well first <laughs> off, when they won in 12, you're like, I can't believe they've won the Stanley Cup. Yeah. That feeling yeah. is just euphoric being at this. Yeah. I was at the party that <laughs> night. It was so great. 13, they almost won it again. They got all the way to the Western Conference Finals. And like I said, that's when I started traveling. When you're traveling mm-hmm. on the team plane and you're going to the hotels and you're in mm-hmm. elevators with these guys, you really feel like, wow, I feel mm-hmm. like I'm part of something. Yeah. Um, and then 14, the whole season I was there. And when they went, we were down 3 to nothing to the Sharks and came back. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, my God, this is insane. That, that whole run was incredible. Yeah, it really, it really is special, especially I would think for, you know, and I know national broadcasters are in the spotlight more, but when you're on the local level, you do get more of a connection. Mm-hmm. You know the guys, and they know you, and I think it kind of opens itself up to better, more intimate, more revealing interviews, too. Totally. I, I think so, absolutely. I, I felt like I was a real, really a part of something. I, I still do. I, I really enjoy, um, you know, everyone always says, oh, hockey players, are they the nicest? And yeah, everybody's nice in every sport. Mm-hmm. It's just different energies in different locker rooms, dressing rooms, what have you. But in general, those hockey players yeah. are, are really, they're, ver- they're very caring. They understand what yeah. you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, they just, especially, especially out here, you know, it's funny that they don't live downtown. They live by the beach. They just want to go hang yeah. out at the nice dive bars and go to the beach. Like, it's just a chill lifestyle. Totally chill. It's a great place to play. Yeah, it's a, and I wanted to segue into the tennis stuff, but I think mm-hmm. a good place would be, you know, it's such a game that everyone plays and it's a great way to stay in shape and stay active. Mm-hmm. And hockey players are at the top of my list for athletes I see that play it and train it in the off season. Mm-hmm. There's some of the, more active tennis players. I think that has to do with the yeah. cardio you get playing tennis. Good point. I heard Kevin Fiala plays uh, a yeah. lot of tennis. I'd like to see those guys play. Um, but yeah, no, it is, it's a great sport. My wife and I still try to hit the yeah. ball around, get a, t- a ball machine at a court up in Santa Barbara. And, and uh, it's, it, ball machine's perfect because yeah. it hits it right where you need it. I think the last time during COVID when Roman Yossi won the Norris Trophy, oh. he had a video message from Federer and he was like a little kid, this Swiss guy getting yeah. a Federer shout out, like oh. congratulations. That's cool. Uh, but yeah, no, I know you're a big tennis fan. We've talked a little bit about it. Were you like from the time you were a kid? Mm-hmm. I, I think I think if I read correctly, your dad was also a fan, so you guys were kind of well, he, oh into yeah the game yeah. But I mean, it was a, a, I was just a huge tennis mm-hmm. fan, and and when I was growing up, I mean, and so I'm 55, so that era, the mm-hmm. 70s with Connors, <laughs> and then when McEnroe burst on the scene and and Borg, and I just I have vivid memories of watching Borg McEnroe <laughs> in those epic uh, finals yeah. at, at Wimbledon. So. Um, that was my initiation to, to the love of, of tennis. And it stayed pretty much through, like through the American, because it's funny, you go by, that's the era there, then the American glory days, yeah. so it'll be tough to top. Oh. The, ma- the fact that you had Sampras, Agassi, Courier just at the top oh you my know, God, in the yeah. 90s when well, the game was exploding too. Yeah, but I, I got to know those guys. I <laughs> yeah. mean, because my sister married yeah. John McEnroe and I yeah. met John when he was number one in the world in 84. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it was like, I think we... I mean, I know for a fact we were together on New Year's going into 85, <laughs> oh, you know, and you he was such a star and I was just so enamored. I could not believe I'm hanging out with, with you know, John McEnroe. He was a, just an they, enormous star. And they had a lot of, I mean, I bring back to the forum, but they had a lot, I feel like more like big time, big feel exos, like Huge exhibitions exos. and LA mm-hmm. had the main ones. It seemed like. Yeah. Well, Mac was in charge of that man yeah. and Jeannie Buss. They put yeah. on, he put on shows. He would get, John would play. I think one year he did a hundred. It's like a summer. It was like a hundred John McEnroe, uh, yeah. hundred nights across America or something. He must have made some serious money. But I got to go. I went down to San Diego, saw him yeah. play V-Lander. I'm hanging out in the locker room, talking to Mats. I mean, <laughs> I got to meet. You know, I played golf with. It was like a foursome. It was uh, me and Pete Sampras and and like John and Courier. You know, it was, <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know. If, I don't there. know if uh, Courier remembers. I see him walking around yeah. here. I'm like Jimbo. Yeah, uh, he remembers me a little bit. Yeah. I think. Yeah, he's he does all his golfing now that he moved out here at Bel Air. Or no, I think he's L A C C now. Is so, he? Yeah. Oh, but no, tough. Jim's the best. Jim came on this show and it was I, I told everyone it was like I could have done it on autopilot. He was so nice, thoughtful, yeah. and just gave tennis answers uh-huh. in a night nice tight like ninety seconds. Yeah. And I'm like, Well, that answers everything I have. I went to th- I was at <laughs> yeah. three of the ties in ninety two. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I was uh gosh, where was the first I was in I know I was in mini Fort Myers. Um, I got blanking on one of the other one, but I went to all three, but then they went to Dallas. They played Sweden in the final. I was not at that. Cause that's right yeah. when John divorced my yeah. sister. Uh. <laughs> and then he still had to somehow yeah. play doubles with, yeah. with Pete. 
and they won that unbelievable it, match. I do wish, and I think we're in the same boat, that the Davis Cup meant a little more because mm -hmm. it was like, I mean, the, it, it was very comparable to the Ryder Cup back in the day, mm -hmm. and now it just seemed to, the new format, I think they're going to try to go back to the old one, but with home ties, and you actually had tennis, that, that's a very buttoned-up sport, yeah. to let loose a little bit, let it tear down, I thought it was a big deal. I wish we could get back to that. I couldn't even tell you what, <laughs> what the format is now because it has yeah. lost all... Yeah. To me, just that, whatever that mm -hmm. interest is. I mean, that would be, they'd be on the cover of Sports Illustrated for, you know, winning the, the yeah. Davis Cup. It was, it was a big deal. So, yeah, I, I hope it gets back to that. I, I do, for sure. Yeah, we caught, uh, I mean, I'm a, of the certain age where I rode the entire Fetter bug from like teenage years all Love the way through. Fetter. And I know that's, yeah, because we all have the where were we when certain things happened. And the one I was going to ask you is, were you awake for the Nadal? Five setter in Australia five five six years ago. Oh gosh, I I, I don't know if I was. <laughs> I don't know what it's hockey was. season but too. I, yeah, I, I could I can tell you though that my wife in a, in 2011 we went to New York and our we on mm -hmm. our bucket list was to go to the U.S. Open mm -hmm. and we were at the quarters, the semis, and yeah yeah and the semis and we we got to the match. Long story, but we, we got there late because we didn't have tickets. And then Dieter Rule, who was the organist for the U.S. Open <laughs> yeah. and the Lakers and the yeah. Kings. Saw a Facebook post where I was like, oh, man, I couldn't get tickets. He got us press passes. We got in. We got to the tippity top of the stadium, and it was an incredible view. Can't really see, but it was in the third set, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. and, and then <laughs> yeah. he was up two sets to yeah. one, you know, and then and then he has match point. It's like 15-40 against, and then, we, and then uh, no, it's 40-15. And then Djokovic just this return on match point, and then, and then the slow – that <laughs> loss was so painful for us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, I Djokovic is going to go down as the greatest because he's got all the accolades. There were, and, and he might have gotten there either way. There's a few matches where, like 2019 Wimbledon, that match in 2011, yeah, it, where you yeah. never know what could have happened. But that had it, and he had the Wimbledon yeah. two final there. That one that went that without yeah. the tie break that yeah. just kept going. Gosh, I remember where I was for that for sure. There was a lot of, I mean, Federer's. You know, and I'm not saying this is someone that's bitter about where it is. Like sports and records are broken, and Federer's ha has a legacy that'll stand alone. It was just about how he played more than that for me. And I'm, st I'm saying this is someone acknowledging that, yeah, he got passed by Rafa and Djokovic, but Federer had a gracefulness to him. Mm. And for me, and I don't know how it was with you, but I just was almost envious of the fact that he could be gracious in defeat. Exactly. <laughs> like yeah. I would be like, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed if I, I lost some of these matches. I know. I know. I feel the same way. I know. It's like, <laughs> yeah. oh my God, because I'm so devastated and he's yeah. gracious. You're right. Uh, I still think to me, it, you know, people say who's your, you know, number one, you know, Djokovic is probably mm -hmm. going to end up with all of them. He'll probably win the Open, I, I assume. I'm, I'm surprised Alcaraz beat him. I thought he was going to get the, mm -hmm. you know, the Grand Slam this year. But to me, Roger Federer is the best. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to, uh, you know, also compare eras too because, you know, it wasn't until the Sampras Agassi era that even like, Australia was the main thing and right. then Slams were the focus. So it, it really go. is hard. I do every time we do these lists though, and it's like who's great. The one guy that I think is impossible to to predict and 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 rate properly is Borg, mm -hmm. because his run was so short yet mm -hmm. so dominant. I know it was a pretty good ten year, de a good decade, right? Though I mean, yeah. it was like early seventies to when he when he shut it down, yeah. and you know, at twenty six years old, and you got Djokovic playing at thirty six. So, yeah. so absolutely, that was surprising. I remember when. John was still like really hurt that mm -hmm. he retired. Yeah. Um, but to me, like, it, who's got the most wins, most tournament yeah. wins? Jimmy Connors. Connors, yeah. You know, and it, so I mean, I think Connors has to be considered mm -hmm. Borg for sure, Sampras, um, and then of course Djokovic, Federer, and Nadal. Connors is another one. Longevity doesn't get talked about mm -hmm. enough because he went. Everyone knows that run at thirty nine, but he was playing deep and getting to semis and quarters of yeah. majors into his late thirties. You know, so it was. But when it's it comes crazy. to all-around all yeah. kind of grace yeah. and skill on the tennis court, John McEnroe has to be, be mm -hmm. up there because he won he won 77 tournaments, yeah. and he won 77 doubles tournaments. I mean, yeah, I would say the greatest doubles player of all time. Mm -hmm. I'd also say that I think it was Andy Roddick who said it perfectly. He's got the perfect tennis game for getting older. Yeah. Like it ages the best of yeah. any game because yeah. it's not built on power or speed. It's just he has his timing. He has those hands at the net. Yep. So he'll be a good tennis player into his, you know, 70s yeah. and 80s. Well, he won all played. those with Fleming. But then yeah. he also won with Woodford, like the U.S. Open. And then he won Wimbledon uh, with Steak. And I was mm -hmm. at that match. Yeah. I flew over there because he was. I knew yeah. he was going to get to the semis. He ended up losing in 92. He ended up losing to uh, Agassi. Got, yeah, just that got was... Boat race. Just got destroyed. Watched that highlight and mm. I saw it. It was the young, it was the young yep. bull coming up. Yeah, but he was in the, yeah. in the doubles 
final, and yeah. they went to Monday. He was yeah. playing with Steak against Runnerberg and Grab, and it got dark. Mm-hmm. And McEnroe was like, "You guys want to play a tie break? Just let's do it." They're like, <laughs> "They're like, no." It went to the next day, nineteen seventeen. He broke it like at eighteen, uh, at like seventeen all. They got That's a break and, and won it. That was incredible. Yeah, my dad still has the story. He's a huge Mac fan, and uh, the Wendell French Open. He's oh, like, joke. he's just like, I left. He's like, I think he was in like law school or something. He's yeah. like, I just left. Like, I thought he had it. And I know. It was like I, know. Two sets I and remember a break where I was. And, yeah. See, John didn't go yeah. to the Australian Open in yeah. those days, but that would have been a year for him to win the Grand Slam. Had he yeah. had he gone to Australia, he'd have won. It's on grass back then. Yeah. And then French, and he ended up just winning the Open, too. Did you, uh, I mean, did you keep up with some of the women's games, the iconic players all the way through? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, love the women's game. It was, it's funny because we've kind of, even maybe more so than men's, we've had this like title holder. Eras are defined by one or two players pretty consistently. This mm-hmm. is like the first time where there's, and it might be Igus Fiontek, it might be certain players, mm-hmm. but I do feel like now that, you know, the, the post Serena world, we thought it might have been Naomi Osaka, but mm-hmm. it's kind of up for grabs for the first time in a long time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like at Wimbledon, like you never, you get these people that are able to get through mm-hmm. and there's some epic matches and very, very exciting. We even saw that on the men's game for sure. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like with Martina <laughs> well, and Everett. The the amount of times that they played each other is right. just insane. And then like Martina has that doubles record of like every Grand Slam seven times. Oh, man. That's, really? <laughs> yeah. It's like, I, I have yet to yeah. see Martina here. That yeah, she be. doesn't come out here too much, but yeah, she's... I mean, legendary. And it's funny because that era of tennis, Martina and probably I'd say Lendl on the men's yeah. side, they were the first like weight training workout era. And now it's like yeah. everybody does it, oh, but no. it was a foreign concept back then. Totally. Yeah, I know. Nah, I don't remember John doing a lot of weightlifting. <laughs> I, can, I can promise you that. But, and he didn't want yeah. to practice. That's yeah. pretty much all he did. But when I walk these halls and suddenly yeah. you see Courier, yeah. you know, I've seen Anna Cohn, um, and then you got Knowles, and like the other day it's like Monica Puig, you know, mm-hmm. winning the gold medal walking yeah. around. I want to chat with them, but they're in a hurry. But I'm like, yeah. oh, man, it's pretty cool to be here. Yeah, the uh, the current slate, I mean, we know Alcaraz is there, but any other players caught your eye or things you're just kind of, I know it's like a broad question, but. Mm-hmm. Man, I, I, I Alcaraz is, he's so athletic. And I just love the final. I watched that final and to the, the drop shot, mm-hmm. like he kept going to it athletically. And that I thought really turned that match around. Um, I, I just thought Djokovic was going to, going to win that match for sure. So very, very um, impressed. Um, the, the man that made the run that got all the way to the quarterfinals, I'm saying very tall. You, um, Christopher Eubanks. Eubanks yeah, 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 he's been around here a few times. Yeah, because yeah. he's worked here. Yeah. yeah, so I was really impressed. I was so thrilled, and he was so gracious in his interviews. And so yeah. I, I'm a big fan of, of his now, yeah. for sure. Eubanks was, I mean, we all were rooting for him, but at 27 to have this breakthough, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. like it wasn't just like he beat good players, but it's like, his game got significantly better. Yeah, and it's he's such a ripping shot. It's such a unique thing. Yeah. Alcaraz too. I mean, like at this point in the game as a true professional, I try to be, you just want to see players win the matches. You want to see them, you know, play their best. And that's what was so beautiful and special was Djokovic didn't give that to him. No, he played well. Yep. Alcaraz had the best set of his tournament in the fifth set of a major final. I know. Like it's, it was a great match. It's special stuff. Um, and, and I just wonder, and this is kind of how we can kind of button it up, but I wonder if, he's going to be pushed like, and I know it's weird to say, but I wonder if he's going to have those guys like Federer had Nadal and Djokovic mm-hmm. and Djokovic doesn't get to 23 if he's not pushed by those two other goats. So yeah. looking yeah. for some people to step up. Yeah, and Murray was there pushing yeah. also. I, I, um, I, I agree. I think yeah. so. I think we will, but man, have we just witnessed <laughs> the greatest era of all time in tennis with yeah. these three insane. Hall of Fame is, you know, it's, it's a little tough to find, you know, and I know there's some worthy candidates out there, but when three guys win all the all the majors, yeah, they're trying to put, so as it stands right now, Federer and Serena are in the same class. I don't know if Newport, Rhode Island oh. can handle that. <laughs> so I heard rumblings. They might have try to have a waiver system because Fed's last year, he only played that waiver cup. Can you move him up a year? Maybe it's good I to have their should, own class, but they if, should have their own class. But yeah, if what, they're both in together. That is kind of you know poetic too. You'll definitely get some ratings, I think, yeah. if they do. Yeah, we've had we've had a good run for sure um, in tennis, and, and you know some of the players that you know got pushed and, and pushed back. It's been good, but yeah, I mean at this point we're just kind of you know looking forward to the U.S. Open. I know you've have you been to all four now or just the? I just haven't the been to the French or Australia. Okay. No, but I did get a chance to to go to Wimbledon in ninety. Uh, Two and I was at the U.S. Open in '85 when I, McEnroe. This match doesn't get talked about enough, but he he played. He was down two sets to one to Vlander. Okay, and came back and won in five, and he got smoked by Lendl. 
for sure in the final in 85, but that's when Lendl mm-hmm. overtook him for number one, yeah. just sheer, just power, just got him. But Mac was tired. That was a tough match in the yeah. semis. That was a great match. It was. It was it's a changing of the guard. It happens in sports and tennis yeah. especially. Uh, yeah. Wrapping up with Patrick O'Neill here on Tennis Channel Inside In, just want to hit a couple things. First being, you know, the Angels and, and working with them. And also, you know, props to you for stepping in last year, especially to the broadcast play-by-play role. Oh, thanks. Sometimes you have to just be ready for opportunity and also to be called into action. That, that's a great point. That, that's exactly what it was. It was... It was not something that I, I was actively pursuing that job. They, I was approached to give it a try, um, you know, when they had uh, some openings for some, some games in, you know, uh, 21. And so um, I did about, I did nine games in 21. And then they said, all right, you know, you're going to, we want you back for 22. Mm-hmm. I was going to be the secondary guy kind of to, with Matty V, Matt Baskersian, who's just unbelievably great. But they had a lot of, there's some technical issues. And next, you know, I was, mm-hmm sprung in action and I did over, I did like 115 yeah. play by play games this year much yeah. less but I still get about 20 yeah. and you know hopefully for more but either way when I sit in that seat and I'm calling a you know yeah. major league baseball game uh, yeah. it's it's incredible what a feeling what a rush and the combined no hitter I heard that one I, I didn't it was or, an actual it wasn't even combined yeah no-hitter, Reed yeah. Detmers yeah. threw a no hitter was the only one in baseball last yeah. year and Crazy. gosh it was <laughs> what a thrill really yeah. it was so much fun do you just still even as a professional being here all the time do you just gush over Otani Yep, what he's doing. absolutely. <laughs> I gush over kind of Otani. I, well, to me, you know, there were so much people. It seemed like fans really wanted them to trade him. He's not coming back. And, and my take was, let's try to win with him this year. Let's, you know, let's go all in. Mm-hmm. And you, a chip in a chair. You get in, yeah. who knows? You catch lightning in a bottle, you can win a series. And next thing you know, somebody, something on the other side happens and yeah. you can make a run. And so I, I hope that happens this year. Yeah, I, I, you're never going to get equal value Mm-mm. for a player like that and you're sending the wrong message to the fan base like i'm just we're just gonna throw in the towel like let's go for let, it i think so yeah. i think there's a number of fans i'm just talking yeah. about some fans yeah. on twitter i think a number yeah, yeah. of fans are really excited that are gonna yeah. make a push yeah. you know and as, as we talk right now they're only you know four out of a wild card and five out of first in the division and mm. get trout back yeah. and so many injuries this year it's <laughs> incredible but he's gonna win the mvp again and that's yeah, it's amazing so- it's going to be what a nice best player contract. of all time. It's, oof, it's, <laughs> it's looking like it. Yeah. Uh, as we wrap this up, what do we have uh, career-wise, maybe outside career-wise you're looking forward to? You know, still a veteran and still at a very, very high level. So I know age doesn't really get in the way of broadcasting career, but what do we got looking Man, forward I, to? I, I, Mitch, thanks for having me, by the way. Yeah. I, I just, you know, I, I think every day is an opportunity for, you know, for something good to happen. And so I really take the approach that let's make today a, a great day. Um, today I'm doing an Angels pre and post game show. Um, so I'm attacking today. Um, I don't know what the future holds. I hope I'm back with the Kings um, for this year. They're still trying to work out a contract with, with Bally Sports. So I'd, I'd love that to happen. And, and you know, I'd like to outlast um, Kopitar and Drew Doughty with the Kings. So uh, I'd like to get to 20 years on, yeah. on that and, and more. And, um, yeah, and then just continue to try to stay healthy and, and blessed. Yeah. I live a, a mile and a half away from this studio. Yeah. So loving life for sure. Staying positive. You know, obviously I know you're a big family man as well. So it's yeah. good to have that balance and have your, you know, your physical and your mental health good. But it's important. The yeah. attitude of appreciating where you are still putting the work in and dedicating it. But it is okay to stick your head up and be like, this is a pretty cool get job I got. I have such a great yeah. job. Because I'm telling yeah. you, when you, if you look back and as you started yeah. this off, you didn't have yeah. the, the, the exact exact prototypical role to, you know, road to this path. And, and uh, yeah, I made it happen. I'm mm-hmm. really proud of the fact that I did considering kind of where I came mm-hmm. from and, and I kind of forged my own path. So I'm, uh, I'm definitely proud of that for sure. Well, Patrick O'Neill, we love to have you on tennis channel inside and always a blast. We'll have to do this again too. And sure. I, I did want to save this for last because <laughs> I went and did research, had no idea because I loved the movie as a kid, but die hard too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, did you so see my part? Way, so I, you went, they totally did you dirty. I just, you know, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know, just because I, I wasn't there yeah. for, with them in yeah. Grenada. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the regular guy got appendicitis, <laughs> so Corporal Telford didn't last. It was a pretty good uh, plot twist at that I, moment. I love that movie. I've seen that scene a bunch. And then, of yeah. course, I'm like, no way. It's Patrick O'Neill. Yeah. Like, what are the odds? That's, but, uh, yeah. that's a great part. If you get a yeah. chance, look up my Beverly Hills 90210 okay. role in The Gentle Art of Listening, season one. Okay. Because I still know all my lines. Okay. Woo. We'll get have to do car. a table read get sometimes. Get in the car, Bonnie. <laughs> Perfect. Patrick O'Neill, always a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for coming on.